we do also know that from surveys here locally in Australia and New Zealand, that pay still ranks um, at the top of the list for reasons why uh, people are deciding to leave. But, but the big but there is that there are other um, very important factors and reasons to leave um, that haven't shown up in previous um, surveys. For example, we've looked into uh, deeper into what employees are after, and, and you're seeing things here that don't talk about money um, in that sense of pay or benefits. We're talking more about balance, location. So to the points that Kate and Graham made, um, these, are, these become almost table stakes for many who are looking for um, that next experience for them that, that really kind of comes at the holistic um, view of, of what it means uh, to be um, a worker in today's world. And so we see organizations really turning their attention um, as offices reopen, as there's more opportunity to do an, a more blended or hybrid version of work um, to really focus on the experience because I would love to hear a little bit more from you as you kind of consider um, specifically some talent uh, programs and solutions that you're considering next year. So Kate, again, we might start with you. If you could name one talent challenge you're facing into and talk us through your thinking about it and what you might uh, plan on for next year, what would that be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so over the past few months, MBN's actually been refreshing our employee value proposition um, or EVP. We've recently established a new vision to be a brilliant wholesaler, enabling Australia's digital future. But so as a result of that and as such, that timing for that refreshed EVP has been really fundamental to how we think about attraction and the retention of talent. You know, what do they, what do our people value about work and their overall employee experience and, and what they're telling us are many things, but one of the most important ones is that work is a subset of their life, um, as, as you've mentioned just a moment ago. We also know that um, our staff are really diverse. So the EVP personas span individuals, couples, families, carers, youth, mature workers, people who work all across, you know, rural and regional and metro areas with a range of different skill sets. And what we're finding in our listening and, and when we're talking to employees is that each person has a really different requirement about what they want from work. And so part of the EVP work is to explore how we think about work. And one of the big, there's one sort of talent challenge or one problem we're really facing into at the moment is that hybrid ways of working. So often when we think about flex or we think about hybrid working, it's a conversation about place. Am I in the office? Am I at home? But actually what we're sort of uncovering is that it's a lot more than that. It really needs to explore when we work and how we work. And the flexibility that comes in is how we engage people and enable them to work in a way that suits them, their work and their personal life. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us to engage people who may be left behind in more of those traditional ways of working. And we know that with COVID, you know, there's lots of um, research about particular groups that are, you know, even further behind than they were 18 months ago. We aren't alone in exploring this. Um, you know, we know that there's been recent studies by Swinburne, and you mentioned from Atlassian as well, but that the Swinburne study talks to more than 90% of workers want to spend some time each week in the office during their working week, and also showed that 43% would consider leaving their employer for better or different working arrangements if Flex wasn't offered in their role. So it's a really um, front and centre talent issue and challenge for us. So what we're doing at MBN is we're testing and learning right at the moment, we've got a series of these hybrid working pilots in play. And the consensus from those is that there is value in having time in the office. People want to come together with purpose and they want to collaborate. And our people desire choice and personalization, but they also want to manage that with their leaders and their teams as they factor in both that business and personal circumstance. Um, we know that at MBN, we're never going to be the five day, you know, work anywhere, anytime, um, and we're never going to be five days in the office. So MBN wants to take a balanced approach to hybrid. We're really thinking about, you know, what works at the company, our employees and our customers and stakeholders. But underpinning our culture is a real sense of connection. And our people and our candidates tell us that coming together with purpose is really important. And we want to lean into that. So I think, you know, in summary, when I think of talent, I, you know, for me, I think about choice. It's really important that each individual has that. It's very personal. We want people to get together and connect for those really key moments that matter. Um, and we want employees and our leaders to have rich conversations about what will work for them, their families, their wellbeing and their needs. But also importantly, what can MBN do to support them in those goals? Um, and I think that's a, a really interesting talent opportunity that we've got in front of us as well. Thanks.
Oh, thanks for that, Kate. That was that was awesome. And I think again, it resonates with so many. Um, there are there isn't a shortage, I think, of discussion and ideas about what hybrid yeah. really mean. And there are many flavors of it. But I, I think that was a great summary of, of what it could be. I think it's evolving as well. You know, we know that what we might set up soon in the short term might change and evolve again and again and so you know it'll be interesting watching lots of companies with how they adapt um, over the next year or two with this space that's right absolutely and i think you, you summed it up well i think the test and learn mentality is a, is a great tip yeah. for everybody on today's um, webinar um maybe over to you james um I think that uh, what would be great to hear from you is whilst your candidates have largely come through your service as a result of an employer decision, are you noticing any trends on what they expect from their perspective um, in their next role? Yeah, absolutely seeing some trends. So the first one, and we work with a lot of our customers and I reference the importance of redeployment uh, and internal mobility before. And so we, love to coin the phrase that uh, talent needs to be seen as renewable, not replaceable. And so this whole let's restructure and actually rehire and the idea that the talent is going to be more scarce, harder to get from the external market is actually driving activity there. So we spend a lot of time talking to customers about the fact that actually do your level best to retain the talent in the first place. But to your question, when the people come through our services and they have been you know, outplaced as a result of restructuring, it's often a wake up call for them. You know, a lot of them haven't seen it coming, have been with organisations for a long period of time. And so one of the number one things on their list is um, what's available in my new employer when it comes to upskilling and reskilling? Do they take care of career pathways? Are they aware of the fact that um, they're going to be consciously informing me about what skills they value and need in the future and then give me the pathways and the learning opportunities to be able to acquire those skills and stay with the organisation? So I think the, the big trend is if there's not a component to upskilling and reskilling, the people we're dealing with will actually second guess whether that's the right employer for them. And final point I'll make on this is there's a big difference between upskilling and, and reskilling. And so without going into the depths of the definition, but you know, upskilling is, in my view, characterised by putting a stake in the ground for where the organisation organization's headed and saying these are the skills that we really value and then providing always on learning opportunities for those people with a growth mindset to acquire those skills over time. Reskilling is much more targeted. It's where there is a group of individuals that might no longer be required or that skill set is not going to be required within a certain time frame, and you're investing much more heavily and in a much more intense time frame to take people from an existing role to a new role. And those roles are ring fenced and available for the people to move into. Otherwise, the ROI or return on investment of reskilling is not there. So, thinking carefully about what your organization wants to do, upskilling, reskilling is critical. Um, but then think about what is, is relevant for your workforce. And the start point for that comes from good workforce analytics. Oh, thanks for that, James. And I, I think that is a great distinction. Um, and I'm sure we could spend hours on it. And we are going to get to skills. We, we can see how skills um, are so central to the discussion about this particular topic of the great resignation, both the solution, but also clearly um, could be a driving issue for why people leave, as you say. Um, Graham, let's finish off with you, because it would be great to hear from you what you think the leaders of tomorrow need to consider. Uh, to help bond their teams to their organizations, um, again, as another means of potentially um, stealing ourselves against the great resignation. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, look, I think James and Kate have summed it up very well, but, but I kind of distill it. Um, when I look at, look at the slide there, those uh, six green polka dots, uh, and, and, and then I'll just add the skills development piece, which James touched on. But for me, I think what's really going to uh, change in the in the leaders of tomorrow primarily is a move towards our servant leadership uh, and I think there's going to be a, a bigger shift in that and those leaders who move quicker to being servant leaders are going to be those who win 
the game in uh, in retaining people and bonding them to their to the organisation. I know at Oceana Gold, it's a big focus of ours. Um, you know, typically a, a very heavy industrial sector is uh, go go go, with little time in between. And and as a result, you know, coming back to a couple of core principles around what I think people really need and want, and are summed up by those green polka dots consideration. I think the greatest change that's going to occur in the way that we lead is greater levels of consideration. And actually, when you look at those items there, balance, location, wellness, flexibility, purpose, culture, every one of those really touches back on, as a leader, what do I do um, uh, to be personally supportive and encouraging, um, as opposed to you know, some of those other items up there. As a result of that, I think the, the, biggest, the next biggest change is, given that there is going to be a bit more of a, it's, a, it's an employee's workplace, um, uh, and uh, is a greater level of increase in participation in goal setting and, and improved communication. And I think leaders who get on the front foot of getting their team members involved in goal setting as opposed to telling them what the goal is um, and you know, improving their levels of feedback and the like, uh, because they may not be in the office as much or they may be in different locations, again, are going to build better and longer and deeper levels of trust and bonds to the organisation. Um, which gets to my final point really around, you know, it, it, it's not so much going to be about, um, you know, an employer of choice, I don't think, or, you know, great places to work and things like that. I really think it's going to be a destination of choice and for, for employees. And you just got to look at some of the negativity that's come out with some of the big techs right now in terms of toxic cultures. I won't name them, but I'm sure we all have read the same articles I have. But and I think people are going to make a choice around, is this a destination I want to be at? Um, taking into account all that's in front of me, not just pay and my boss and things like that, but things such as, do I get balance? Um, is this psychologically safe uh, and the like? And, and then to sum up, just with the point James raised, I think underpinning all of that with the recognition that the world and the world of work is changing so fast is, does my boss have his or her eye on me to make sure I keep, you know, ahead of the Joneses. So I certainly think that skill shift and the recognition, whether it be upskilling, cross-skilling, whatever it may be, uh, if your boss isn't prepared to keep an eye on it and, and foster that support and have those conversation pieces with you, um, you know, you, you're going to lose out as a boss and so will the company.